Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Ishwar Prasad. Ishwar is a professor of trade policy and economics at Cornell University. He is also a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and a former head of the IMF's China Division. Ishwar is the author of numerous books and articles and frequently appears on TV and in print. He joins us today to talk about his new book on China's rising currency titled Gaining Currency, The Rise of the Renminbi. Ishwar, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure, David. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a real treat. I enjoyed your book and I followed your work. And uh, it was was great to read this. Also, it's a good time to be reading this book, given all the current events going on around us. The new president has some pretty strong views on China. Um, Before we get into that, though, I would love to to hear how you got into economics, what led you down this path to become an international economist, what was your journey. In your book, you mentioned Robert Lucas, one of your teachers. So tell us about that journey. Well, getting into, into economics at one level was the path of least resistance because <laughs> uh, in India, I came from a lower middle class family and education was seen as the way of uh, um, uh, leading to a better economic future. And I sort of enjoyed economics in college. And then I um, got admitted to a good graduate school in the US where I decided to keep going. And when I came to Chicago, I really uh, developed a, a deep intellectual fascination with uh, economics. And that's where... Um, I learned how economics can be very useful in terms of thinking about a multitude of issues beyond uh, economics. Perhaps we economists take it a little too far in terms of using our economic frameworks to understand and interpret real life, but I found that useful. So after I finished with Chicago, I went to the International Monetary Fund because I wanted to do some work um, that was at the intersection of both academics and policy, and the IMF um, at the time was a very exciting place to work. It continues to be. Mm-hmm. Um, the head of the research department at the time was uh, um, Jacob Frankel, a very well-known international oh, yes. economist. So um, I went there and started working on a variety of issues. Now, when I went to the IMF, it turns out I didn't know very much about international economics. But after having spent about five to six years at the IMF, I decided I had to learn something about international economics finally. Um, and there's no better way to learn than to try mm. to write papers. So that's what I um, ended up doing. And of course... The training I received at Chicago, including uh, through my advisors, uh, Lucas, Robert Townsend, and Michael Woodford, came in very handy in thinking about these issues. And over time, um, um, both my policy work and my academic work have sort of um, uh, come together in a nice way. And right now, of course, the sort of work I do, uh, which is in international finance, uh, related mostly to exchange rates and capital flows with an emphasis on emerging markets, brings together a lot of my interest in international finance, monetary economics, and mm. basic macroeconomics. So it's been a nice journey to where I am right now. Yeah, you've been very productive. But it's interesting you kind of cut your teeth on international econ and, and international macro at the IMF. So real-world analysis, real-time, I mean, that, that's fascinating. The IMF so. was a wonderful place to do international economics because not only were they a very well-trained PhD economist, but mm-hmm. there were issues all around you, so there was yep. no dearth of research topics, just going to the cafeteria and talking to a few people standing in line for their uh, coffee, yeah. you get a ton of ideas. Uh, um, and most of the people at the IMF didn't have t- time to work on those ideas. Being in the research department, I had the luxury uh, of having yes. time to work on those ideas. I was briefly at the U.S. Department of Treasury and International Affairs when John Taylor was there. And, and you know, the research department, the IMF, was kind of, you know, seen as this lofty, this, you know, revered part of the IMF where lots of good research was coming out of it and stuff and, and good people were working. Um, so I have good recollection, good memories of, of interacting with that department as well. Um, well, let's get to your book. Again, a, a fascinating read. And you begin by going over the history of the Chinese currency. So this is about the Chinese currency and the related issues surrounding it. I want to talk about the history, because the history itself, I think, is pretty fascinating. So you obviously did some work looking back at this. And I think many people know China was the first place that had paper money. Um, and it was first linked to some commodity. It wasn't just fiat money initially. You, you mentioned later that Kublai Khan was the one who innovated that idea of fiat money as legal tender. 
But you mentioned, you know, several interesting stories and things that you know, I did not know until after I, I read the book. Among other things, um, when money was dis- was first paper money was first created during the Song Dynasty, which is nine sixty to twelve seventy nine A.D. One of the reasons it comes about is because the Chinese develop a movable press. And you mentioned it, this occurs four centuries before the Gutenberg press. Now, so, you know, most of us in the West, we think back to great innovations. We think back to the Gutenberg press. But the Chinese apparently discovered that a long time before the famous Gutenberg press. So was, was that shocking to you, too? It, it kind of blew my mind when I, I saw that. This whole chapter and the uh, issue about Chinese economic history came up because I was struggling um, in trying to find a way to start the book. Once one starts talking about the capital account, exchange rate mm-hmm. issues, and so on, I was oh, in yeah. more familiar turf, but I was struggling with how to start the book, and I uh, sort of knew this uh, um, uh, fact that China had invented the first paper currency, so I started digging into it a little bit. Yeah. And then I had a couple of uh, undergraduate students from Cornell, Chinese students, who really got into the project and helped me dig up a lot of archival material, which is how this chapter came about. And to be honest with you, this um, once I started reading about Chinese monetary history, I spent about two months doing just that, and I almost derailed this project because I was considering writing a book about Chinese monetary history, which is fascinating in and of itself. So, for instance, as I point out in the book, many of the monetary debates that we are having in uh, these yep. days uh, had their antecedents in the Confucian era debates, even in uh, 150 to 200 BC, yep. um, when many Confucian and non-Confucian scholars were debating the role of the state in issuing and preserving the value of money. And as you pointed out, China did have the first uh, paper currency in the world, which perhaps should not be too much of a surprise because after all, paper was invented in China. But what is even more interesting is the fact that China also had the first fiat currency, um, a paper currency that was not backed by commodities or precious metals. And we learn about this from the writings of Marco Polo, um, who talks about how the Grand Khan which is how he refers to Kublai Khan, Mm -hmm. had come up with the most wonderful form of alchemy in the world. (laughs) All that Kublai Khan had to do was put his imprint on mulberry bark, which is what paper was made of at the time, and people throughout the land accepted this as money in exchange for goods and services. So how did Kublai Khan convert his paper currency into a legal tender that was uh, um, uh, just a fiat currency? He did this by basically issuing a proclamation that anybody in his domain who did not accept his currency would be put to death. That's a very effective way of creating a fiat currency out of uh, a legal tender uh, out of paper currency. So uh, it turns out that um, one of the consequences of that was that eventually China also had among the earliest episodes of hyperinflation because Kublai Khan had some degree of monetary discipline, but it turned out his successors Mm -hmm. uh, did not have that sort of discipline. So they printed too much paper money to finance uh, war expenditures. And so China had um, uh, hyperinflations um, later in the Yuan dynasty when there were um, uh, kings that uh, emperors who followed Kublai Khan. Um, And subsequently, um, paper money came in and out of uh, China Um, For a while, it uh, got so debased that paper money disappeared. They went back to commodity money. And then later on, um, in the 17th century, once again, uh, they went back to having paper money. So it was a long and interesting saga, even of paper currency in China. Yeah, you could write an entire book on this. But what you mentioned earlier also struck me is that they had many of the debates that we've had in the West. So you think of like David Hume as the first person coming up with a quantity theory of money. Well, their discussions, they, they understood the quantity theory money long before David Hume did. And, and some of their debates, as you mentioned, between, you know, the Confucians worrying about if the state gets a hold of, of paper money, they'll be debased. I mean, they were discussing these issues that later the Bullinus controversy in, in England or, or the, the banking and uh, debates. It, it, so it was just striking to see that what we think are novel, original debates centuries before the Chinese were, were kind of working through it themselves. Also, you know, the, the Kublai Khan episode you mentioned about um, it became fiat legal tender by decree. Capital punishment was, was the incentive. You know, there is this debate in monetary economics. How does money emerge, right? Is, is it an emergent thing? Carl Minger, you know, that the most saleable asset eventually kind of emerges. Or is it state? Is it a state theory of money? And this is a great data point, I guess, for the state <laughs> theory of money. By decree, you're going to use this or you're going to die. So 
Um, interesting data point, I mean, for that, there's other episodes where other forms of money emerge spontaneously, but this is definitely an interesting data point. Yes, and the Confucian scholars, in fact, um, uh, well before Kublai Khan had the view that it would be better to have private money circulating because the private issuers would then have a strong incentive uh, to maintain the value of their money and not let it be debased. Um, but um, uh, there was a very famous uh, um, uh, eunuch called Sai Lun, who actually became the chief uh, eunuch in the emperor's court in 200 BC, uh, who was a Confucian scholar, but took the side of the non-Confucians in arguing that mm. only the state should have the privilege of issuing money, because that was the best way to guarantee the value of money. But it was a, a raging debate at the time. I mean, it, it, it makes me think of the kind of free banking Austrian perspective. They think, you know, the, the private sector banks should be the only ones making money versus you know, the state. So again, these are debates that have been visited well before many of the people we think were the first ones to do that. Well, let's move forward to Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalist Party. Um, they, so they, they're coming in, you know, much more recent here, 1928. He established the Central Bank of China in Shanghai. And um, you mentioned in the book that once the Japanese occupy Manchuria, they set up their own central bank and there's literally a currency war. So we talk about currency wars today, you know, going on because of money losing value against another. But there's literally a currency war between these two central banks. Tell us about that episode. Yeah, so China, uh, in addition to having the privilege of having the first paper currency, the first uh, fiat currency that was legal tender, among the first episodes of hyperinflations, also had the first real currency war. How it came about was that the Kuomintang government of the Chinese nationalists um, was in control of most of China by the um, early 1930s, but the Japanese uh, had already started their incursion uh, through the north, and they set up a puppet government uh, in Nanjing. And they realized that uh, having the control of money would be a very important part of exercising broader political and economic control. So while the Kuomintang government was trying to um, increase the use of its currency, the Japanese started promoting their own currency. Now, the Kuomintang government had a number of problems of its own in order to finance war expenditures. They had issued too much of their own paper currency, uh, which got debased, and they had an episode of hyperinflation around the mid-1930s. And then the Kuomintang government put in place uh, a reform uh, well known to Chinese as the Fabi reform. They issued a new currency called the Fabi that was in principle backed by US dollars or British pound sterling. So the Japanese started buying up the Fabi, taking it to the uh, banks in Shanghai. Shanghai was a very important financial center even at that time. And the Japanese started draining the Shanghai banks of their reserves of pound sterling and dollars. So in fact, uh, the US and the UK tried to prop up uh, the Kuomintang government at the time. But the Japanese also decided to undercut the Fabi currency by setting up their own central bank and issuing their own notes. Now, both of these uh, two, uh, both of these currencies were being intermediated through banks in Shanghai. And this is where the all-out war started because the Japanese um, puppet government in uh, Nanjing, the Wang Jingwei government, set up a branch of its central bank in Shanghai and the Kuomintang central bank also had a branch in Shanghai. And what happened was open warfare on the streets. So, for instance, um, the Japanese-backed uh, 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 Nang Jingwei government uh, essentially started dynamiting uh, the branches of the Kuomintang Central Bank. And the Kuomintang wow. government, in turn, started pulling bank employees of the Japanese-backed Central Bank on the streets and executing them. So there was blood on the streets of Shanghai. So if you think that these days we have currency wars, it's nothing like the currency wars that the Chinese experienced at the time with real blood on the streets. Right, and, and I imagine the intensity, the feelings are running high because the the, the bank out of uh, of, out of uh, the Japanese central bank probably they, they felt the Chinese that were on their side were traitors. So it's probably a really you know serious, um, deep emotionally felt uh, debate. Now. The communists come in after, after, so after World War II, Japan's defeated. There's a, you mentioned there's a brief uh, truce there, but the, the communists come in, and that brings us into the modern currency that they now have. Um, but before we get there, I just want to briefly go back to an episode under the Nationalist Party. Um, so b b maybe this was actually during the time they had this, this, this debate of this, this currency war going on. But they had backed their currency up to silver for a while. Is that correct? 
That's right. It was initially backed by silver and then um, backed by uh, U.S. dollars and uh, pound sterling. Now, you're using the term Komotong, right? That, and that's the same thing as the Nationalist Party? That's the Chinese Nationalist okay. Party. All right. So they had their currency backed by silver. And Milton Friedman, I've read this somewhere, mentioned that, that China did not experience the Great Depression because they were on silver. So, you know, kind of the standard story for the Great Depression. Why was it a global event? Because all these countries were linked to gold, tied to gold. Um, so can you speak to that at all? Was, was that, is that true that, that they avoided the worst part of the Great Depression? That's right. They avoided the worst part of the Great Depression. Now, China wasn't that well linked into the global trading or financial okay. system at the time. So they were somewhat uh, insulated. Um, certainly, there was a strong trade link with Britain uh, even at the time. But um, relative to the early uh, 1900s, that link had eroded to some extent. Okay. Um, but certainly, yes, the Chinese government was less constrained um, than much of the rest of the world, including the U.S., because their currency was not tied to the gold standard in any way. Okay. So even if they had been on gold, you're, you're, you're saying that they weren't as interconnected as some of the other countries were. That's right. Made them more susceptible. Yeah. Okay. So the, uh, the currency as we know it today, the renminbi appears. Um, you mentioned it becomes the sole currency in 1949. Um, the People's Bank of China is introduced in 1948. And you mentioned it, and another interesting fact that Mao Zedong, the leader of the Communist Party, wouldn't let his image be on the currency. Now, you know, my, my vision of the currency is that he's all over it, but that's a recent phenomenon, right? That's correct. Um, uh, we are all used to seeing the image, the iconic image of Mao's uh, frontal image yeah. on every um, yuan banknote. Um, but in fact, that was not the case early on. So the um, People's Bank of China, or the PBOC, China's central bank, came into being in December 1948, which was about a year before the People's Republic of China, or the PRC, was officially, uh, officially came into being. That happened in October of 1949. So the People's Bank of China started issuing the renminbi, which literally means the people's money, uh, in late 1948. All those really picked up steam in 1949. Um, and I found some archival material about how the um, PBC central bank governor at the time goes and pleads with Mao Zedong, saying, you are the father of the country, you are the father of the party, and everybody wants your image. And Mao in turn says, no. This is the people's money. I am just a party functionary, so my image should not be on the currency. So, in fact, it turns out that the first four series of banknotes that were issued uh, did not have the full-face image of Mao on them. Um, the very first series of banknotes had a variety of uh, um, um, uh, ethnic uh, uh, people's images in there. And over time, the evolution of banknotes also traces the notion of what is considered the idealized version of society. So, for instance, in the third series of banknotes issued in 1987, uh, one of the banknotes has this uh, a picture of um, uh, an intellectual, uh, a farm worker, and an industrial worker all together, uh, this being the ideal mixture uh, of what a well-functioning society should contain. In the fourth series of uh, um, RMB banknotes, um, uh, there is one banknote which has uh, four leaders on it in profile, including Mao, Zhou Enlai, and a couple of others, but it's still not Mao's full face image. It's only the fifth series of banknotes, which is still circulating to this day, and that was issued in 1999 uh, at the 50th anniversary of the People's Republic of China's formation, that Mao's image comes to be on every uh, banknote. But why that happened is also interesting. And here again, I found some archival material about these very intense discussions among uh, the officials of the Currency Printing Bureau. The biggest concern they had at the time was counterfeiting. Um, so there is a long discussion about what image would be best to put on the banknotes in order to limit counterfeiting. So they consider a variety of historical figures, a variety of well-known landmarks, and decide that the only thing that everybody in China can recognize, whether literate or illiterate, whether in the coastal or interior provinces, is the image of Mao. Hmm. So now every Yuan banknote has the image of Mao on it. So the purposes of avoiding counterfeiting, they had to res resort to his image because it was the one common image. That's, that's fascinating. Now let, let's go back to the name Renminbi, um, which you said means people's money. And, and we're going to use RMB interchangeably with that as an abbreviation, but Ren, Renminbi is the name. Now, the other name that's commonly used is the Yuan. So can you tell us when to use you know, one or the other? Because I often have confusion over this issue. I'm sure many of our listeners do as well. 
So technically the renminbi is the name of the currency and the yuan is the unit of account. Perhaps it's easiest to explain this by analogy to the British pound sterling. So the pound sterling is the name of the currency, but when you walk into a store in London or to a a uh, pub in any British city, um, you're going to get quoted a price in pounds, not pound sterling. So the pound is the unit of account, um, while the pound sterling is the official name of the currency. Um, so if you walk into um, uh, a store in Beijing, typically you're going to get quoted a price in yuan because, again, that is the unit okay. of account. Uh, in colloquial conversation, just to make things a little more complicated, there is another term called kuai, uh, which sort of translates into a buck or a quid. Um, so that's the more colloquial okay. form. Um, there are many publications uh, like the Wall Street Journal, which um, stick with yuan, even when they're talking about the name of the currency. Certain publications like the New York Times seem to prefer the use of the um, uh, renminbi. Um, but technically, you should be using renminbi when you are referring to the currency and yuan when you're talking about a specific amount of the currency okay. as a unit of account. That's good to know. We'll, we'll use uh, RMB as an abbreviation moving forward in this conversation and, and interchangeably with renminbi. Okay, so that's the interesting history of, of China's currency. It brings us to the present. Well, let's move forward to um, the kind of exchange rate regime that's been going on. And, and then later we'll talk about kind of the three aspects, three criteria to a rising currency, which kind of shapes the outline of your book. But let's talk about the exchange rate regime, because this is something that's been in the news for almost a decade, or maybe, maybe more. Um, I remember when I was working back at Treasury, it was a big deal in the early to mid-2000s. And, and now with President Trump, it's, it's re-emerging as, as a big issue. All this talk about their currency being undervalued, although most observers today would say it's not no longer undervalued, maybe if it's even overvalued to some extent. But let's let's talk about what has happened to the currency. So you mentioned from 1994 to 2005, it was pegged to the dollar. Um, a, a pretty hard peg, or was it a soft peg? What, tell us about that, that arrangement. So until nine, um, in the years just before 1994, China had a dual exchange rate. That is, it was an official exchange rate mm -hmm. relative to the dollar and other currencies. And there was a market exchange rate um, because uh, um, the official exchange rate often diverged from supply and demand conditions in the foreign exchange market. So you had a different currency. So in 1994, they unified those two and um, pegged the currency's value to the dollar. So if you look at uh, um, a chart of the renminbi's value against a dollar, it's a flat line all the way till June of 2005. So what China was basically doing was making sure that they were uh, influencing demand and supply in the foreign exchange markets to make sure that that exchange rate stayed flat. So it was a very rigid, very robust fixed exchange rate. Now, so with that said, the, the question arises, well, in what sense were they undervaluing it during the early to mid 2000s? And you mentioned in your book they were having a rapid productivity growth in manufacturing. And, and when you have rapid growth like that, typically it, it creates upward pressure on the currency. The currency wants to naturally appreciate it, but by pegging it, they were avoiding that. Is that correct? That's right. Now, the economists don't understand very much about day-to-day um, uh, -day or month-to-month -month movements in exchange rates. But what we do know is that over relatively long horizons of a few years or longer, um, how much productivity an economy is able to generate relative to the productivity growth in its trading partner countries tends to drive exchange rates. So if a country has higher productivity growth than trading partner countries, its exchange rate adjusted for inflation tends to increase in value or appreciate. The problem with currency appreciation, of course, is that it makes exports more expensive to uh, importers abroad. So your exports become less competitive. And China wanted to have more exports. Um, so what China did was to prevent the value of its currency from rising. And how were they doing that? Essentially, by selling their own currency and buying up foreign currencies, especially the US dollar. Um, now, China was um, uh, exporting a lot, a lot more than it was importing. And because China was a fast growing economy and continues to be, there was a lot of financial capital pouring into China. So when you have money coming into an economy because it's exporting a lot more than it imports, or because investors want to invest in that country, usually the value of that country's currency tends to appreciate. China didn't want that, so it was instead taking all those dollars, euros, yen, and other currencies it was receiving, 
and recycling them by buying more dollars, euros, or yen. Mm. A lot of it was uh, buying dollars. Um, so that way they were preventing the currency from appreciating as fast as market forces wanted it to appreciate. So this allowed them to keep their com uh, exports somewhat more competitive. Um, and this was underlying the notion of China undervaluing its exchange rate. That is, China, by intervening in the foreign exchange market, was uh, keeping its currency from attaining a higher level that markets wanted to push it towards. Um, that pattern persisted until about 2014, when things shifted. Okay, so here's a question I've often had. So we can agree that the China, by keeping its peg very rigid, very fixed, was avoiding this appreciation. Um, but even if it had allowed the appreciation, it was an emerging, rapidly growing economy, right? There still would have been many of the dislocations that politicians here complain about, right? So, so many of our labor-intense jobs would have gone in any event. So how much of, of the loss of jobs, the exports, you know, that went overseas, how, how much of that can we attribute just to China being a large economy that's opening up, developing versus the manipulation of its currency? Now, here is the interesting, there is a notion that China has um, had the economic boom. It has largely because of uh, exports. It turns out that's not quite the case. In fact, if one looks at the early period of the 2000, say from 2000 to 2005, mm -hmm. um, the contribution of net exports, that is exports minus imports, to China's overall growth was relatively modest. China had only a relatively modest trade surplus during that period. During 2005 to 2007, that surplus did increase. So here is the secret about China. China has actually been growing much more because of investment rather than because of exports. Exports certainly play an important role, but it's not that the Chinese economy has depended mostly or largely uh, mm -hmm. on exports in order to drive its growth. The other interesting thing is um, uh, an aspect of trade data that often gets forgotten. It turns out that if you look over the period, say 2000 to 2005, when the U.S. trade deficit with China rose very substantially. A lot of it was because China entered the World Trade Organization in 2001, and that allowed it to get easier access to markets in the U.S., Europe, and so on. So many manufacturers in Asia started using China uh, as part of their supply chain. So you would get many goods where the mm. components were coming from other countries in Asia. Um, they would then be um, processed in China and then sent abroad, but now with a Made in China label. In fact, there was an interesting analysis done by the Wall Street Journal about um, uh, three or four years ago, where they pointed out that if you take the um, uh, list price of an uh, iPhone, um, at the time the list price of the iPhone was about $500, um, and if the iPhone was um, quote-unquote manufactured in China and sent to the U.S., that entire $500 would count as a U.S. trade deficit relative to China. But if, in fact, if you looked at how much of the value was added in China, it was very modest. It was mm. only about $50 to $60 worth. Why is that? Because the iPhone components were coming from manufacturers in Korea, Thailand, um, Taiwan, um, Singapore in some cases. Um, and uh, about 30% of the uh, um, iPhone's list price, of course, is Apple's profit margin, and Apple still is largely a U.S. company. Um, so the amount of value added in China was about one-tenth the value of that export, but the entire 500 to $600 gets counted as a U.S. Uh, trade deficit relative to China. This doesn't explain all of the U.S. trade deficit with China, but the trade figures do tend to get somewhat distorted. So going back to the question you started out with, even if China had allowed its currency to appreciate, given the relatively uh, cheap labor one could get in China, given the fact that they were getting good productivity growth, you would still have had a lot of exports from China. Um, and uh, um, essentially, since China was just acting as a um, processing base for many of these exports, the U.S. may have ended up running similar trade deficits with other low-wage manufacturers. Um, so the notion that all of what we're seeing um, in terms of, say, the decline in U.S. manufacturing can be laid at the uh, foot of trade or especially trade with China, I think is somewhat misleading. Yeah, and I, I think that's the hard part of economics is doing the right counterfactual, right? It, you know, what would have happened in the absence of, of that policy manipulation of currency? And I, I agree. And, I, and what, 
what I've read suggests, you know, that it, there still would have been very similar trade patterns. And it's also interesting your point about the supply chain, the global supply chain, which I think many politicians miss, and that is you can't just look at one country because there's so much more going into that. The value added can be much smaller than the, the price. That's the, the, uh, the actual trade deficit. Very interesting. All right, so 2014, you th- things changed in terms of the, the value of the currency being you know, underappreciated. Tell us about that development. So in 2014, um, some concerns start building up about the Chinese economy um, because it looked like growth was slowing down. Um, and in addition, what the Chinese government has been doing um, uh, related to a subject that I'm sure we'll turn to, which is trying to make the currency somewhat more prominent in international finance, they had started making it easier to take money into and out of the country. What we economists would call is reducing restrictions on capital flows or reducing capital controls on both inflows of money into China and, more importantly, outflows. Um, China uh, saves a lot. About um, half of Chinese output each year is saved by Chinese households, Chinese corporations, and to some extent, Mm -hmm. the Chinese government. So there's a lot of savings, private savings in particular, locked within China. And what China decided to do was to give its investors, including households, corporations, institutional investors, the opportunity to diversify their portfolios by investing abroad. This is something they wanted to do for a while. But they were opening the capital account outflows at the same time that concerns were building up about the Chinese economy. And then in 2015, one had the big stock market run up and the crash in the middle of 2015. So all of these concerns led to capital beginning to flow out of China uh, at much greater rates. Um, And this led to substantial downward pressure on the currency. So China, which until then, until mid-2014, had been trying to prevent the currency from appreciating and buying up dollars in order to prevent the currency from appreciating, suddenly found that things had shifted, that it had begun to uh, uh, act in order to prevent its currency from depreciating uh, and was selling dollars. Now, one might ask, why was China trying to prevent its currency from depreciating? If that's what the market wanted, maybe it wasn't such a bad thing for China because, after all, a weaker currency would mean that China's exports were more competitive, which could actually help the economy at a time of weak growth. But the concern that the Chinese government had is that too much capital flowing out of the country too quickly could destabilize the financial system. If people started pulling deposits out of the banking system, it could undercut the stability of the banking system. Um, And the one thing the Chinese government dislikes is volatility. They prefer stability and control. So even if the renminbi was going to depreciate relative to the dollar, they preferred that it happen gradually. Um, Now, the problem is that in financial markets, if people think that a currency is going to go in one direction, there is no easy way to do it gradually because people expect the currency to depreciate. So they start pushing the value down, and then it becomes very difficult for the central bank or the government to control that. But that's the uh, difficult spot the Chinese central bank has been in since mid-2014. Now, you mentioned they wanted to have a controlled flow of capital. They didn't want the big panics. One reason they avoided the uh, depreciation. I'm wondering to what extent were they also worried about dollar-denominated debt that corporations had and stuff? Because if the dollar quickly devalued, lost value, um, it would increase the real debt burden of these these firms. Is that a real issue that China's concerned about too? Now, China, um, Chinese corporations do have a lot of debt, but the interesting thing is that most of that debt is domestic and denominated in RMB. Okay. If you look at the total amount of uh, corporate debt that um, uh, Chinese corporations had issued in foreign currencies, such as the dollar, um, euros, and so on, um, around early 2015, that number was about $1.6 trillion dollars. Seems like a lot of money, but remember, this is an $11 trillion economy. Okay. Plus, China at the time, um, um, in early 2015, still had about uh, $3.6, $3.7 trillion worth of foreign exchange reserves. So China was not a typical emerging market economy where a fall in the value of the currency would make the value of the foreign currency denominated higher mm-hmm. uh, and make it very difficult to pay off. Uh, But certainly this added to the downward pressures in the currency because when um, the renminbi started depreciating against the dollar, 
and the value of that foreign currency debt in domestic, that is renminbi terms, started rising, corporations naturally wanted to start paying off that debt. So that also led to a flow of capital out of the country at a time when other forms of capital outflows were also kicking in. So this is what made things very complicated. Okay. A lot of capital flowing out for different reasons all at the same time. Now, um, a lot of this foreign currency debt has been paid off. There's still estimated to be about 600 to $700 billion left. Again, seems like a large amount in absolute terms, but relative to the size of the economy, it's not a major concern, either for individual corporations or for the economy as a whole. Because it's, it's a big economy and they have a large stock of reserves which can pay that off. That's right. um, you, you often hear the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS, talk about this $10 trillion figure of dollar-denominated debt outside the U.S. And as the dollar gets stronger, it, it, it's, it makes that debt burden heavier. But in the case of China, what you're saying is it's really a, it's a, it's really a drop in the bucket for them. It's maybe the other emerging countries it's a problem, but not so much for China. That's right. China um, has always had a very low level of external debt um, relative to the size of its economy or relative to the size of its reserves. So um, that's really not a huge concern for China. For uh, certain corporations that have um, uh, gone haywire in terms of issuing dollar-denominated debt, maybe it could be a problem, but uh, systemically this is not going to be a problem. Well, that kind of answers my next question, and and that is, you know, so starting in 2005, they, they started following kind of a weighted basket of currencies. And the dollar, as you mentioned in your book, was the most important one. And they've kind of changed the ways as time has gone along. And, and something that, ha- if that's, given that's the case, that the, uh, the RMB is still you know, tracking the dollar, not as tightly as it was before 2005, but still tracking it. Then beginning in mid-2014, the dollar begins its its biggest cent, right? And so as the Fed begins talking up rate hikes, you see the dollar going up. It kind of plateaus in 2016, and lately it's gone back up. So I wonder to what extent did, you know, Fed policy and the stronger U.S. dollar weigh into any of the considerations of the Chinese in 2014, 2015? It was a very important factor. Uh, In 2005, um, when the People's Bank of China took the RMB off the dollar peg, they said that in principle they would be managing the currency's value against a basket of other currencies rather than just the U.S. dollar. But in practice, what they were doing was managing the currency's value against the dollar rather than a basket. Um, And this has created complications for them in a variety of contexts. And um, starting in 2014, those complications came to a head because, as you've pointed out, uh, from 2014 to, to the middle of 2015, the dollar did start rising against many of the other major um, currencies like the Japanese yen and the euro. And because the RMB was still managed against the dollar, it went up along with the dollar. And it made very little sense from a Chinese domestic perspective because their growth was slowing down right. while their currency was appreciating. Um, so this was another uh, disconnect um, between what was happening to their currency and what was happening in their economy. And um, uh, I think markets also saw through it, and this is one reason I think we may have had pressure building up um, on the uh, RMB to depreciate because people saw um, that there was this inconsistency that could only be resolved by uh, having the PBOC let the currency value drift down against the dollar. Now, in the past few months, um, the Chinese uh, central bank has again tried to get the message out to markets that now, seriously, it is managing the currency's value against a basket. But the reality is that most people in China and most financial market participants outside China still have a laser focus on the RMB dollar rate, not Mm. the other bilateral rate. That's partly because most of the trading on the Shanghai foreign exchange markets in China and also offshore markets like the ones in Hong Kong, most of the trading is still the RMB dollar bilateral pair. Um, And the reality is that that is the thickest um, uh, traded market. Um, So most of the betting about the RMB's value does take place in terms of that uh, uh, currency. So once again, China is facing this odd situation where their growth has sort of stabilized, but now there is the prospect that although uh, Mr. Trump is trying to talk the dollar down, all his policies are likely to lead to the dollar uh, strengthening if you have um, an expanding fiscal deficit, if you have stimulative policies that goes up the U.S. economy. 
while at the same time the European Central Bank and Bank of Japan want to maintain monetary policy so the dollar could strengthen further against the um, uh, Japanese yen, against the euro, um, which means that again um, the PBOC would be in this difficult position of um, uh, letting the currency's value depreciate against the dollar, which could once again uh, raise concerns and in this case concerns not just among financial market participants but it could bring a strident reaction from the new administration that China is trying to quote unquote cheapen the value of its currency and the irony in all of this is that for years um, the uh, US Treasury um, the IMF where I used to work uh, were all telling uh, China that it should not manage the value of its currency it should let the value of its currency be determined by market forces. And now the entire world, including uh, Trump, uh, are telling China, don't let market forces determine the value of your currency because then the currency would depreciate against the dollar. It is a rich irony. <laughs> you finally let the market do its magic and <clears throat> you get the results you don't want and you change your story. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's challenging, it's frustrating to, to see Trump still kind of hold of the view or, or claim that the dollar is stronger because China is manipulating its currency as opposed to what you just mentioned. The expected path of interest rates in the U.S. is going up and Europe and Japan is going down. That divergence is really driving the dollar, not what's going on in China so much. But another interesting, I guess, observation from that is is this this tension between what the Fed was doing in you know, 2014, the, the talking up rates, what's going on in China. It speaks to the, the influence the Fed has on global monetary conditions, right? It it, the Fed has a domestic mandate, but its influence is felt around the world, and and it's it's a tough you know job if you if your focus is domestic, but you can create these global spillovers that can come back and uh, affect the domestic economy. Well, let's let's move on then to the to the um, the rest of your book, and you mentioned three criteria you know for a rising currency. If a currency wants to become you know important currency, and that's the name of the, the subtitle of your book, The Rise of the Renminbi. And you mentioned you know that how open is the capital account the internationalization of the currency, and whether it becomes a reserve currency. So let's, let's talk about the, the opening of the capital account. First, what, you know, what is the capital account for our listeners, and, and what has China done to, to make it more open over time? So opening the capital account is basically the notion that um, um, financial flows that are not related to underlying trade transactions um, can be done in a relatively unrestricted fashion. So for instance, if... Uh, uh, a U.S. investor wants to invest in the uh, Shanghai stock market or um, if uh, um, a Chinese uh, uh, household uh, wants to invest in the New York Stock Exchange, um, say in a mutual fund, uh, um, um, that becomes easier to do. Or for a Chinese corporation to invest either in stocks or some hard assets in the U.S. Um, so basically freeing up restrictions on capital inflows and outflows is what opening the capital account is. And for a currency to become an, a reserve currency, one that is held by uh, foreign central banks in particular, but also uh, investors more broadly, uh, one of the key criteria is that foreign investors need to be able to acquire and easily trade uh, financial assets denominated in that currency. So it's hard to imagine that um, uh, the renminbi could become a viable uh, reserve currency uh, in the medium to long run, by which I mean the next three to ten years, unless... Uh, China makes it easier for investors to bring money into and take money out of the country. Now, they had been pushing reforms. You mentioned many of them in your book. But recently, they've also been tightening down a little bit, haven't they? That's right. Um, um, China has made a lot of progress in terms of opening up its capital account. Until about um, uh, five or six years ago, um, foreign investors could directly invest in China in the form of what is called foreign direct investment, that is, they could set up new firms or buy uh, mm -hmm. large shares in existing firms, but they could not easily invest in the stock market or bond markets. Uh, China has now opened up its capital account to inflows uh, more broadly and also to uh, outflows. Now, one of the uh, reasons they were able to push through many of these reforms was because China wanted one very important price, uh, which was to allow uh, which was to uh, get the uh, International Monetary Fund to include uh, the Chinese renminbi in its artificial currency unit called the Special Drawing Rights, um, which until uh, last year had just four of the elite currencies in it, uh, the U.S. dollar, the euro, the British pound sterling, and the Japanese yen. Uh, 
Um, China is now the second largest economy in the world, and the Chinese want their currency to have big international stature. So what the IMF had told China was, we can consider this, but in order for your currency to become uh, uh, part of this SDR basket of currencies, you need to have more free uh, flows of capital across your borders. You need to have a more market-determined exchange rate. You need to have more freely market-determined interest rates in your banking system. So that price that China really wanted turned out to be a very important spur to many reforms, including opening the capital account. China did get that prize. Um, uh, it became effective in October of 2016, although this, the decision was made in November of 2015 um, that the RMB would become part of the SDR basket. So that was a very important spur for many of the reforms. But since then, mm -hmm. um, because of the capital outflows and because of the uh, volatility that it has created in currency markets, China has slowed down on capital account opening and in some respects has even made it harder um, to take capital into or out of the country, especially out of the country. Yeah, I was just reading an article <clears throat> where individuals can take up to $50,000, but the government now is requiring further documentation, more red tape, more barriers to get that money out because of the capital outflow. Now, you mentioned in your book as well the net errors and omission part of the balance of payment. So, there's a part of, of measuring this flow of, of capital that's not being recorded because people find ways around the capital controls, around the restrictions. And you show that it's actually been, that, that measurement problem has been getting bigger over the past few years, even before, even before the capital flows heightened. Is that correct? That's right. And it's flipped, actually, because when there was uh, pressure on the RMB to appreciate, everybody wanted to buy more RMB because the value of the RMB was going up. Mm. So in fact, at the time, this measure called net errors and omissions, which basically um, is a way of uh, um, reflecting all the capital account transactions that don't go through official channels, that number was positive, meaning that people were bringing money into China uh, through unofficial means. But over the last three, four years, it's turned negative, meaning that money is flowing out of the economy through unofficial channels. One of the proximate reasons it may be going out through unofficial channels is that uh, President Xi Jinping intensified an anti-corruption drive over the last two or three years. And there is a belief that there is a lot of money that corrupt officials now want to take offshore because they are concerned about expropriation. And of course, they don't want it to go through the uh, traditional banking channels because that would expose uh, all hmm. of that ill-gotten wealth. So they're finding other ways uh, to take it out of the country. So it cannot be clearly measured in the official accounts. Uh, it gets measured as a residual, which is what this net errors and omissions is. Yeah, so as, as I read that, it reminded me one of the critiques of capital controls is that corruption and will emerge. And, and as an economy as big as China, it, it's hard to imagine a, a really, truly secure fence that could be put all around that economy. And secondly, as you mentioned in your book, they don't have the institutions, you know, the, the levels of, of, of you know, of courts and, and, and rule of law and all those things that could truly enforce the, those barriers to keep capital from flowing out. Well, let's, let's move on to the, the next thing. So we've got capital account opening, and the next element is the um, internationalization or how widely used the, the uh, currency in China is, is becoming. And you mentioned a number of examples. Um, it's not quite yet what we call a vehicle currency where other countries will use it as a, a transaction purposes between two other uh, currencies. But tell us, how is it progressing in general? Is it going in the right direction? It certainly made a lot of progress given that it was starting from basically zero in a variety of criteria um, related to internationalization. So if you look at the amount of international trade transactions that are being denominated and settled using RMB rather than a vehicle currency like uh, dollar. That went from um, virtually um, nothing to nearly one third of China's overall trade a couple of years ago. That number has since fallen back because of all the concerns about the RMB to about 23, 24%, but still um, from a start of zero, um, basically four or five years ago, that is not a trivial amount. The RMB now accounts for about 2% of global payments, um, that may seem like a very small number, but that puts China now among the top five or six currencies in terms of global payments. The dollar, of course, dominates. Um, the euro comes um, uh, well behind, um, but most other currencies account for a very, very uh, 
trivial fraction of global payments. So the RMB is making progress. If you look at the amount of uh, RMB-denominated deposits offshore, the amount of RMB-denominated bonds being issued by corporations um, in the Hong Kong market, uh, those numbers rose very impressively in the first four or five years um, after China started uh, making a push for its currency to become an international currency. All of these measures have leveled off in the last couple of years and mm. some have, in fact, uh, receded a little bit. But I think if China plays its cards right by continuing to open its capital account, trying to reform its financial system and its economy more broadly, it will continue its progress as, uh, as an important international currency. Two very uh, <clears throat> interesting observations you make in the book on this point. Um, number one, China has built its own cross-border international payment system. Um, so it's kind of like chips in the U.S. And that it's not a big deal now, but it has the potential to be an alternative way to transfer funds across borders. And you also mentioned, interestingly, that it could one day replace SWIFT, which is how they, you know, they transfer information about financial transactions. So that, that was an interesting, um, very sobering you know, assessment, especially from the U.S. perspective. Yeah, there is an important geopolitical angle to that as well. Um, during the um, Crimea crisis, um, when uh, the West imposed many sanctions uh, on Russia, uh, the effective way that those sanctions worked was because Russia lost access to many of the payment systems um, that are controlled by the West. I think China has taken some very important lessons from that episode and knows that control of international payment systems not only reduces um, uh, the costs of financial transactions for Chinese, but in addition, allows it to not be vulnerable to, um, uh, to um, the Western powers that could uh, use that as a choke point if there were to be a geopolitical conflict. So China has uh, taken very aggressive moves to develop its own cross-border payment system, which allows its financial system to get better connected to the international financial system, but as you noted, also has the potential to eventually uh, supersede something like SWIFT, which right now is the only major uh, interbank messaging system that is used for transactions among domestic or um, international banks. Yeah, that, that was uh, <clears throat> very interesting. You also mentioned in the book the central bank um, in China has established swap lines, so currency swap lines, where central banks will exchange each other's currency and they have this understanding with 36 other central banks, including the Bank of England and the ECB. Now, the Fed's not a part of this yet. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, this is another interesting part of the Chinese currency's um, journey to international prominence. It has made some progress in terms of being an international currency. In the book, I draw a distinction between that and another concept, which is that of a reserve currency held by foreign central banks as protection against balance of payments crises mm -hmm. or by foreign investors for um, uh, some degree of safety. Um, and typically, one um, the prerequisites that were thought to be important for a currency to become a reserve currency were not only that the economy had to be large and have a well-developed financial system, but also that it needed to have a market-determined exchange rate and an open capital account. China does not have these two yet, and yet its currency has already become a reserve currency as evidenced by this fact that you pointed out, that there are 36 central banks around the world that have signed um, bilateral local currency swap arrangements with the People's Bank of China, which gives them access to renminbi liquidity if a crunch time were to arrive. Now, why would so many central banks care about having access to RMB rather than dollars? In the book, I argue this does not mean that the RMB has arrived, but really it's a, a sign of how very many major powers, including Japan, Europe, uh, the UK, Canada, all want to be seen as friends of China because it is a rising and very important um, economic power. Um, and in addition, it shows that all of these countries are making what I think is a very low cost best bet that the RMB is one day going to become prominent. So they're sort of lining up Mm. and placing a very cheap bet on that prospect right now. So uh, these are the things that I think will allow uh, China to translate its economic might to in increasing international stature of its currency. And so the third part of, of this, this, this third criteria, which you've touched on, is, is becoming a reserve currency, and, and China, again, is making progress. There's a long ways to go. And I, I wanted to ask you, 
because you bring up this idea of the Triffin dilemma in the book, which is a very fascinating idea that who the the I think the way I would I, I think about it is the main reserve currency of the world, the rest of the world depends upon it to provide, you know, money, safe assets that they can use, but that requires it to to run current account deficits. It requires it to send these assets abroad and the way they do that is by, by you know, by running current account deficits. And you know, it was my impression that that it's inevitable. You're going to have to run a current account deficit. You're not convinced of that, though. You're not convinced that it necessarily requires that the. I mean, I'm being very kind of abstract here. The U.S. is the main reserve currency of the world, running current account deficits, and you're not convinced, at least in the book, that that has to be the case. That's right. So if you look at the reserve currency economies right now, um, they don't run current account deficits, and it hasn't affected their ability to remain reserve currencies. So. The Swiss, the Japanese, um, the Europeans as a whole, um, the Eurozone as a whole, uh, they have not run very large current account deficits, so it's not affected their ability to have reserve currency status. So one might argue perhaps that not every reserve currency does, but the anchor or the dominant reserve currency still has to um, provide liquidity to the rest of the world. Now, the Triffin dilemma made a lot of sense when Triffin... Uh, talked about his dilemma, which is when the gold standard was in operation. So at the time, the U.S. needed to be um, uh, willing uh, to provide uh, gold in exchange for dollars uh, upon demand. These days, things have changed. Um, Take the U.S. right now. Uh, The U.S. could, in principle, supply all the liquidity the world needs, while at the same time, its own investors could be investing in the rest of the world. So the U.S. could, in fact, run a balanced current account even while uh, it was providing all the liquidity the world needs. So in a world where you don't have a gold standard and where you have free flow of capital, uh, the Triffin proposition does not hold. Now, China is a very long way away from becoming a dominant global reserve currency. So on the path to becoming a significant reserve currency, there is certainly no requirement as uh, uh, evidenced by what is happening with the uh, euro, the yen, and so on, that they need to run a current account deficit. And the point I make in the book is that even if one day they were to challenge the U.S. dollar as the dominant global reserve currency, this is not a given that they need to run current account deficits. But of course, in the book, I argue there is little prospect that the renminbi will in fact become a a dominant reserve currency um, that could rival the dollar. Well, let's talk about that in the time we have left. So you have a chapter called The House of Cards. Basically, you know, going forward, what are the big problems? So some people look at the, there's a natural growth slowdown as, as China transforms more into a service economy. Um, there's some people who argue that there's a debt overhang. There's a mass, the gross debt levels in China have increased dramatically from about 2008 to the present. Um, you, you're much more optimistic in terms of growth prospects, but you do worry about the institutions in China, and that may prevent it from becoming a safe haven. So talk about that. So the Chinese economy has a huge amount of risk, especially in terms of debt in the corporate sector. As I argue in the book, these are going to be very costly to resolve, but I don't think they will bring uh, Mm -hmm. the Chinese economy down. Um, But how well China manages these um, um, problems it has created for itself because of its growth model is going to be interesting to watch uh, as an academic, but I'm not in the camp that sees uh, disaster around the corner. But even if China does not uh, face an economic disaster, is the RMB going to continue uh, its unmitigated rise and perhaps one day rival the dollar? Here in the book, I argue that there is a different concept one has to um, add to the mix, not just an international currency or a reserve currency, but a safe haven currency. A safe haven currency is not just a plain vanilla reserve currency, but one that foreign investors have trust in. Uh, And what is essential for this trust, I argue in this book, um, is that you need a combination of institutions. What I mean by institutions are an open and transparent democratic form of government with institutionalized checks and balances um, so that, you know, economic policy does not go haywire because there is an inherent correcting mechanism. Second, you need the rule of law. That is, foreign investors must have the trust that they will be treated on par with domestic investors. And third, you need independent public institutions, like the U.S. Federal Reserve, for instance, um, that uh, foreign investors can trust will preserve the value of money. China has ostensibly made a commitment to market-oriented reforms to its economy and to its financial system, 
But President Xi Jinping's government has at the same time repudiated decisively both in word and in deed any political, legal or institutional reforms. So I argue in the book that while China's economy might continue to prosper and if China plays its cards right with economic and financial market reforms that stabilize growth at a decent level, then China's economy um, could continue growing decently and the currency might become a viable reserve currency, perhaps one day, um, by which I mean in the next uh, decade or so, even challenging currencies like the pound sterling or the Japanese yen. But is it going to become a safe haven currency that could one day rival the dollar? I think not. One last question <clears throat> related to this idea of a reserve currency. Is there a natural tendency in the global economy to gravitate toward just one main reserve currency? So if the dollar, if it wasn't the dollar, would it be something else? In other words, are there economies of scale, network effects that would naturally push us towards one currency with some other ones in the margin playing a role? I think most of us economists would say that if you we were starting with a blank slate, we would not design the international monetary system that we have today, where there is one currency that is so dominant, mm -hmm. um, and where the country that owns that currency, in fact, has no incentive to run disciplined macroeconomic policies, because we are in this very strange equilibrium, where if the U.S. creates a financial crisis, or if the U.S. runs bad policies, people have nowhere but the U.S. dollar uh, to run for safety. If you had uh, competing reserve currencies, perhaps we would have a more stable equilibrium. Um, but given where we are right now, um, with a lot of deficiencies and defects uh, in individual countries' policies and in the structure of the international financial system, perhaps it makes sense to have one anchor currency that everybody can rely on and trust uh, at a time of crisis. So I don't think it's the best equilibrium we've arrived at, but given all the defects that I spoke about, um, perhaps it's not bad to have one currency that everybody can trust. But it's certainly not an ideal system by any means. All right, but given the world we have, it's where we are and, and maybe the uh, suboptimal equilibrium we're stuck with for now. Our guest today has been Ishwar Prasad, the author of Gaining Currency, The Rise of the Renminbi. Ishwar, thank you for coming on the show. It's been my pleasure, David. Thank you for that conversation. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>